There was a man who had done very well for himself. He worked very hard and over the course of his lifetime earned several million dollars. Near the end of his life, he began to be very concerned about what would happen to his money after he left the world. His wife said, well, you have so much money and and I don't need very much. You should donate most of it. Maybe give it to the church or give it to a local shelter, somebody that can use it. And he didn't like that idea. He worked so hard for his money that he wanted to keep it as much as possible. So he gave his wife these instructions. He said, go to the bank, withdraw as much of it as you can. I want you to put it in a big trunk and I want you to drag that trunk up to the attic and I want you to place it right over the bed where I'll pass away. When my soul leaves my body and I pass through the attic, I'm going to grab my money and take it with me to heaven. She didn't think it was a very good idea, but she respected her husband and loved him very much. So she did that. She went to the bank. She got a bunch of money. She put it into a big trunk. She dragged it up to the attic and she placed it right over his bed. Sadly, a few weeks later, he did pass away. And she sort of forgot about the trunk a little bit with all of the funeral arrangements and everything. And a week or so later, she thought, oh, yeah, that's right. I put that trunk up there. Let me go see if he was able to take the money with him. She went up into the attic. She opened that trunk, and unfortunately, in the trunk was all of the money she had put there. And she said to herself, I knew I should have put that trunk in the basement. Let's start off 2024 with a somewhat inappropriate joke for church. We're going to talk about money at church. I know if you're here for the first time, you're like, oh, great. This is great. Why couldn't we talk about something less awkward like hell or sex? (laughs) But um, we're going to do a series called uh, Generous, and we're going to spend three weeks talking about money. And the reason we're going to do that is because there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to money, especially in the church. There's a lot of people, it's a very sore topic, maybe a lot of church hurt revolving around how you were taught about money in the church. And I'm going to share some helpful things about finances uh, in your personal life and, and also when it comes to the church, maybe even confront some myths. But I do want to make this promise to you. I will not in any way this series make you feel guilty about what you do or don't give to the church. I promise that to you. On the contrary, I think that if we truly look and see what the Bible says about money, it will unlock spiritual growth in your life. I promise that. And that doesn't have to do with how much you do or don't give to the church. Let's start off with this first thing that we know the Bible says about money. The Bible says, get ready to write this down, money is the root of all evil. Money is the root of all evil. That's what the Bible says. Wait, what? It doesn't say that? What does it say? The love of money is the root of all evil. You guys are right. That's actually what the Bible says. But you know, most people think that the Bible says money is the root of all evil. It's a simple misconception that people have. It's funny because I've seen this meme around a few times. It says, if money is so evil, why do they ask for it so much in church? I'll put this up on the screen. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, Paul writes to his protege, a pastor. He says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money is the root of all kinds of evil. See, Money itself cannot be the root of evil. If money is at the root of all evil, then money would have to be at the root of all morality too. You see? It's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Remember, evil comes from within. It's an action that we take that's based on pride. Remember this, money is a tool. And it can be used for good or bad. Think about this, like your shoes. Your shoes are inanimate objects. Everybody look at your shoes for a second. 
They cannot be good or bad. Your shoes can take you to good places or they can take you to bad places, but it's really your feet inside the shoes, isn't it? It's what comes from the inside. A lot of people think that money is bad just by itself, especially if you have a lot of money. It's very popular in this culture to look at people who have a lot of money and go, oh, those greedy, heartless, overambitious capitalists, the one percenters. Mm, these one percenters, they have so much and they're so greedy. Well, be careful. Be careful what you say about wealthy people because here in the United States, almost all of us are one percenters when it comes to the rest of the world. If you and your family make $32,000 a year, now that probably doesn't count for kids and some teens, but I bet you most adults in here together have a combined family income of at least $30,000. You are in the top half 1% of all of the wealthiest people in the whole world. So if money makes you evil because you have a lot of it, we're all evil. And I'm looking in this room and I don't see evil people. Matter of fact, money is a tool that takes on whatever characteristics exist in the user. If you're an evil person, you use it for evil. If you're a good person, you'll use it for good. By the way, there are plenty of people in the Bible who were very, very wealthy. Many people in the Bible. And we're going to look at some of those people in the next couple weeks. So I understand it's the love of money. The love of money that's the root of all evil. Here's the next thing that the Bible says about money. It cannot make you happy. Money cannot make you happy. It seems obvious, but if that's the case, why do so many people try to acquire so much of it in an effort to get happy? There's a quote by the actor Jim Carrey. He said this. He said, I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. That reminds me of a guy in the Bible named Solomon. Now, don't lose your place in Matthew, but let's turn over to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is where we're going to go. Now, Ecclesiastes is sometimes kind of hard to find, but if you turn to the very middle of your Bible or right around there, you'll find likely Psalms or Proverbs, and the book of Ecclesiastes is right after the book of Proverbs. Solomon is known as one of the wisest men in history, or maybe even the wisest man of history, even though he made plenty of mistakes in his life. It's interesting because uh, God came to Solomon and said to him that he would give him anything he wanted. He could have fame and riches. And what Solomon said is, I don't want those things, I want wisdom. And so God not only gave him wisdom, but gave him those other things as well. And it's amazing because he was given so much, you would think that that would make him happy. But look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. Solomon writes, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also Vanity. Vanity means it's meaningless. It's pointless. The person who loves money is never going to be satisfied with it, nor the one who loves wealth, his income. It's amazing if you think about that. The more you have, the more you want if your attitude's in the wrong place. Now let's just go one chapter forward to chapter 6. And look what he writes in chapter 6, verse 1. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. Who's he talking about? Himself. He's lived it. He's had it all, but it didn't make him happy. 
Let me say this about money. Money makes you happy in the same way that ice cream makes you happy. It is a short burst of pleasure, not long-term contentment. Think about this. Imagine that you had all of the ice cream in the world. Imagine that maybe you owned an ice cream company and you could eat ice cream every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the rest of your life, every flavor that you loved. Matter of fact, imagine if that's all you ever ate. I promise you this. Uh, First of all, those of you who are lactose intolerant are in big trouble. (laughs) But you would grow to loathe it. You would grow to hate it. The thing can... I heard somebody say never. (laughs) I'm out. Trying to disprove my point here. You can substitute something else, you know. All the guitars in the world. All the golf in the world. All the pizza in the world. Whatever it is, you realize if that's all you had, the thing that brings you a short burst of pleasure and happiness does not simply bring you contentment. As it turns out, happiness is actually the byproduct of contentment. Contentment is being happy with what you have, no matter if you have a little bit or if you have a lot. That famous verse that we all know in the Bible, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's about contentment. It's about Paul saying, sometimes I don't have very much. Sometimes I don't have much money. Sometimes I don't have very much to eat. And sometimes I have all the money I need. And sometimes I have everything I need to eat. Either way, I'm content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you're not happy when you have a little, you won't be happy when you have a lot. So we know that the love of money is the root of all evil. We know that money cannot make you happy. But here is a really, really important point, and that is money actually can be a distraction. Two ways. It's often the thing that pulls people away from God. I want you to turn to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. We're not going to come back to Ecclesiastes, so you can lose your place there. But let's go to the New Testament and look at 1 Timothy. This is one of two letters that Paul wrote to his young pastor friend, Timothy. Timothy was, uh, he had a challenge in his church there that had to do with finances, Uh, Some people were becoming very wealthy, and that was causing them a problem. That verse, the love of money is the root of all evil, we often read that verse, but we don't read the full context to understand what he was talking about. Let's go to verse 9 first, and then we'll continue. I'm sorry, it's actually 1 Timothy 6. I don't know if I said four. First Timothy six, verses nine and 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going back to nine. Very confused right now. Here we go. First Timothy six, nine and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then he says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. See, once again, it's attitude. It's what's in our hearts. It's for the desire of money that becomes the new focus for our lives and leads us away from God. Those who desire to be rich often fall into temptation, he says. It's almost exactly like what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24. I'll put this one up on the screen. No one can serve two masters. 
For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and what? Money. Money. You see, if you look at this verse carefully, and I hope you do, there's an important distinction. Can you have money and serve God? Yes. They're not mutually exclusive. The issue is, which one will you serve? Can you serve money and serve God? No. You can't serve money and you can't serve God. Think of it this way. There's only one throne in your heart. Seated on that throne either needs to be God or money. You cannot have both. And in a real sense, what Jesus is saying here isn't just about money. It's, it's whatever you try to serve alongside of God. Some people want to serve their career first and serve God second. You can't serve two masters. Some people, maybe it's their family. Their family is the thing they serve and also God. Again, can you have a family and serve God? Yes. Can you serve your family first and God later? No. Maybe it's reputation. Maybe it's self-image. Maybe it's your ministry. This is a tough one. We were just talking about this as a, as a team. Do you know it's difficult sometimes for people in ministry because it's like your spiritual life often becomes your job. And now you, instead of making sure that God is the central focus, you make the church your central focus. And it's, it's tricky because it kind of feels like it's the right thing. But it's not. You can't serve two masters. God has to be seated on the throne of your heart first Here's the second thing, and this probably hits a little closer to, to home for, I think, for most of us. It's not necessarily the desire for some people to acquire money that becomes the distraction. It's the worry about money that becomes the distraction. Like maybe you're saying like, yeah, I don't, I don't need to be rich. That's not my problem. I don't, I don't have that distraction. Okay, but do you worry about money? Do you worry about having enough? Do you worry that... Uh, your, your bills might not get paid. Do you worry about your, uh, your uh, retirement? Sometimes we worry about what we don't have, especially when we see how much other people have. And that's dangerous, isn't it? It's hard to be content with what you have when somebody else that you know, somebody that you love, Somebody you feel might not even deserve it has a whole lot more. That's difficult. What do we do when we sense that? How do we deal with that? Well, it's in the Bible again. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 6 where we started because Jesus addresses this very clearly. In verse 25, he says, therefore, I tell you, do not be, what's the Bible say? Anxious about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And he moves on and he says in verse 31, therefore, don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, but God knows that you need them. But here is the solution. But, he says, seek first, what? The kingdom of God. And all of these things will be given then to you. The solution to worrying about what you don't have is focusing on what you do have, which starts with the kingdom of God, which starts with the gift you've been given from Jesus Christ. You can have contentment even if you don't have a lot of money because what you do have is the promise of eternal life, forgiveness from sins, the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Those are the things that you have. When you focus on those, what Jesus himself is promising is that you will have the rest of those things at the level that you need. And don't compare yourself to other people. 
If you do compare yourself to other people, here would be my suggestion to you. You might drive down the road and see somebody driving a fancy sports car or a big, beautiful truck or whatever it is that you wish you have and compare yourself and go, boy, I wish I had a nice car. Compare yourself to somebody who has less. There are plenty of people who have less. If you look around this room right now, I promise you this, there's somebody who has more than you of whatever it is. Bigger house, more money, better car, whatever. But you know what? There's somebody who has less. Somebody here has much less than you. And if you were to expand outside of these walls to the rest of the world, trust me, there are people who have so much less. It's interesting. Brian and Ali are talking about going to Haiti. It's one of the greatest experiences that, that you can have. I've been, I think, five times to Haiti. Wonderful mission trip. You will encounter people that have next to nothing. People who still live in houses made out of sticks and mud. You will also encounter some of the most content people you've ever met in your life. It's amazing. It's amazing. It doesn't mean they're not without challenges, obviously. But for so many people, their attitude has become trusting in God. That leads me to my last point. And this is really important. If you've never thought about this, I would encourage you to really engage this. Maybe write it down. It all belongs to God anyway. This is such an important point. Money. All of it belongs to God. What's in your bank account, what's in your wallet, everybody, everything you have, everything in your house, everything in your garage, that all belongs to God. It doesn't even matter if you're a Christian. Everything that non-believers have belongs to God too. This is what David said in Psalm 24, verse 1. I'll put that up on the screen. He said, the earth and everything in it, the world and all of its inhabitants belong to the Lord. Now, suddenly, everything we've talked about takes on a really new dimension because when we realize that everything belongs to God, it can really help us see finances in a new light because you don't have to worry about your money or lack of it because it isn't even yours. It belongs to God. It makes perfect sense why it can be distracting. If we set our focus on wanting something that doesn't belong to us, we can't have the blessings. You know, you can't take a blessing. A blessing has to be given to you. Understand, it can't make you happy. Money can't make you happy because it's just a thing. It's a concept. But instead, the one who owns it all can help you find lasting contentment. And of course, then money can't be evil. Why? Well, because it belongs to God. If money belongs to God, how could it be evil? God wouldn't give us something inherently evil. So where does that leave us? Well, no matter what you think, no matter your struggle, no matter your viewpoint, no matter what maybe church hurt you have over money, I want to tell you this. Um, Money is a part of our lives for good and bad. It is a challenge. So how do we handle it? How do we live? Well, the overwhelming answer in the Bible is that we should live generously. Generously towards God. Generously towards others. Even generously toward ourselves. Now, how do we do that? That is a great question. That's what we're going to cover over the next couple weeks. Let's pray.